So we're doing some NFL on the show this evening. Uh, decades of both official and unofficial barriers in place. Black players finally taking a lead when it comes to the quarterback position. We are going to talk to the journalist Patrick Ruby. He has been writing about this in The Guardian and charting the last, uh, well, number of decades and how things have evolved in the NFL. So that's on the way this hour. Then after 8 o'clock, we'll have Hilary Allen with us. That's OK if you don't know who Hilary Allen is. She is a sky runner. That's a sky runner, and she's got an amazing story to tell coming your way after 8 o'clock. And then Lisa Fallon in the next hour will talk to us about Ireland's one-all draw. Disappointing draw, it must be said, with Greece in the Euro 2021 qualifiers this afternoon. And then we'll have Dan McDonnell on the football show. Rob Daly as well will join us with the latest on goings-on at Bayern Munich. And Dan McDonnell's here now. Dan. Joe. I mean, it's good to see you again, Dan. This is actually just, just, just a reassuring... <laughs> you've got a reassuring presence. Oh, dear. It's good to have you back, Joe. What's wrong with me? Richie, you also have a reassuring presence. I would say fair. threatening presence. <coughs> no, not threatening. Weirdly threatening. Slightly more... Sort of, slightly, sort of, mean. slightly more sarcastic presence. That's harsh. Yeah. It's needlessly harsh, though. Joe is just world-weary at times. Well, not, I mean, not we're in a good place now, though. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> Great place. <laughs> <laughs> Just take three weeks off, I think, every um, every 12 and you'll be fine. Every so often, yeah. Uh, Hilary Allen is going to join us after 8 o'clock. You won't know who she is. I didn't really until uh, this week. She's a sky runner. Do we know what a sky runner is? I do not. Okay, that's perfectly fair enough as well. So, uh, an ultra runner is somebody who runs long distances, as you might imagine. Basically, that starts post marathon post the 26 miles so uh, really if you want to be called an ultra runner runner you're doing a minimum of about uh, 50k or 30 miles Jesus. and on it goes up you know 100 miles 100k on it goes so if that's not difficult enough for you if ultra running doesn't really float your boat then you can become a sky runner which is where you kind of go up mountains a little bit so minimum incline of 30 uh, percent and then when you do that for like 20 hours at a time you are a sky runner so Hilary Allen uh, was doing her master's in neuroscience. I think she's a high achiever. I think we can safely say that. Sounds that. Yeah, she was doing her, <laughs> her studies in neuroscience and uh, found it all a bit stressful, as you would. And as a release, she started running and didn't just start doing a 5K jog like we would do. She started sky running and became so good within two years that she was a professional. So that was that's pretty impressive she for a start. She didn't start off by doing like the really steep incline on the treadmill in the gym and just <laughs> craved more. So like, this incline isn't enough. It's a great question. What, what, what have you got for me here? That's a good point. Uh, Dan, we'll put that to her. Uh, so the reason we're talking to uh, Hillary is two years ago, she was doing a sky race in Norway. She was 31 years of age, a 57 kilometre run. About halfway through, when she was on this narrow ridge, uh, approaching a 1400 metre summit, uh, she lost her balance and slipped. Now, you've no protective gear. You're just literally in a pair of shorts and a T-shirt. So she fell 50 feet. And then she bounced along the mountain for another 100 feet. So the fella who was running behind her, his name was uh, Par, Manu Par, he's uh, Spanish. Uh, he was behind her, about 15 metres behind her, and he, he, I, so he had to kind of run down afterwards. He said, the worst thing was the sound, a human body bouncing against rock. It was awful. And he got down to her, he said, I didn't even check her vitals, I was sure she was dead. A while later he sees that her stomach's going up and down, she's not dead. The reason he thought she was dead was her body was contorted in all sorts of mm. weird ways. And she woke up, helicopter came. It took two hours to get her into the helicopter. And she was awake for a lot of this, so painful. In the end, she had 12 broken bones, two broken, broken bones in her back. She broke both her arms. She needed hundreds of stitches. There was a cut in her thigh that he was trying to hold closed for her. He'd never met this woman before. Mm. Uh, he said he could have fitted his hand so easily into the cut in her thigh. I know. I know. Sure. And over the next two yeah, weeks, over the next two weeks, over the next two weeks, she had five operations and she was told, you ain't running again. Within 10 months, she won a 48 kilometre race. And two years later, this year, Dan, she went back to Norway where it happened and she nailed those 57 kilometres with Manu Par, the guy who found her and sat with her the whole time. Ah, what a story. Come on. This is just like when Superhands got addicted to running in peep show and ran all the way to Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a much better reference. I would have gone for Forrest Gump, and you've gone for uh, Super, Super Hands, Hands and Beef Show. Always go with Super Hands. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. That is extraordinary. Extraordinary. How yeah. do you feel about your three week holiday now, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> what did you do in your holiday, Joe? Less proud. So I'm 20 lengths one day. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, there we are. That's on the way after 8 o'clock. That deserves better, though. <laughs> you want to listen to <laughs> The infinity pool, Dan. <laughs> so, uh, that's on the way after 8 o'clock. Lisa Fallon as well. We'll talk NFL this hour. And uh, Lisa Fallon will be talking to us about Ireland 1, Greece 1, which, as they try mm. and 
book their place at Euro 2021, Richie. It's where your news run starts. Yeah. It was uh, disappointing, massively disappointing. Yeah, it was indeed because we took an early lead uh, over in Panionios but were denied right at the death. As you say, the Republic of Ireland women's side two minutes away from victory in Greece this afternoon but had to settle for a draw in a Euro qualifier. It finished Greece one, Ireland one with the Greek leveller coming in the third of five added minutes in Panionios. Amber Barrett's fine goal gave Ireland the lead on 30 minutes only for Anastasia Spiridonidou to break Irish hearts. Ireland remains second in Group I, four points clear of today's hosts who visit Dublin in March. Because Ireland still have to play Ukraine away and they still have to play Germany home and away and really Germany are going to whoop everyone. They're probably Looks like it, yeah. tournament favourites as opposed to even just uh, group favourites. Uh, this was disappointing. Greece are fourth seeds and it was it was very um, kind of telling moment when Vera Pau, manager now in charge for her second game, did the TV interview in RTE and she was not mincing her words, you know, hugely um, disappointed weren't in the game at all, we didn't put together enough play, we need to learn how to dominate games, we're not dominating games, we gave the ball away too carelessly at times, uh, really to the point interview yeah. and summed it up. It did and I like you know you're kind of watching the coverage and there was a sense that people are sort of dancing around you know dancing around the discussion of of how disappointing it actually was mm -hmm. and like there is I, I saw Tina Foley write something actually in Independent on Monday about actually Phil Neville and some of the criticism Phil Neville received and how like that's the necessary next step that you know it has to be like vigorous criticism like I saw the press release from the FEI there and I mean it's just the FEI like you know Ireland remain unbeaten in their group as the yeah. headline I mean they conceded a 93rd minute goal yeah. and, um, and that goal was coming as well Ireland couldn't keep the ball enough no yeah, like, they were I mean, really poor on the they ball they were avoiding a lot of Greek pressure yeah. on themselves especially yeah. in the second half no, it was it was they bad. should have put the game away it was bad it was yeah, really it was bad and performance you know I mean, I've seen different views I, I saw some people who were maybe involved who actually were quite critical of, of, of Vera Pau in the sense that could she have changed things up and refreshed the side? She made one change at half time, um, but then didn't make any subs, take until seven minutes to go. Um, that's part of the discussion point. Um, maybe they just weren't clinical enough when they had the chances at 1 0. But I mean, there's obviously a lot of discussion about getting to that next level and becoming a sort of a more a clinical team generally. And uh, that today. You know, was was poor and, and 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 should be called out as poor, not just for the sake of it, but actually not going to improve. And like, like Vera Pair then spoke and said, "Yeah, that wasn't good enough." And people were like, "Oh yeah, actually it wasn't good enough." I mean, it wasn't good enough before that either. Yeah. And uh, you have to move beyond sort of patronising comments about bravery to like actually, you know, standards. And there's some really good high standard of players in that team, and they will know yeah. rather than anyone else needing to tell them. Mm. That was a. That was a bad result. Yeah, it really. In the context was. of where, where where they were with two minutes to go. Alan Colley was making the point that Amber Barrett, who started up front and scored the goal and was getting involved in play and did well, she was moved out to the right wing in the second half after half time, and he thought that was a dreadful move and kind of mm. scratching his head about that. So that was an aspect as well which Vera Pau didn't bring up in the no. uh, interview as she wouldn't. And so I think you know when when you because there has been no real, I guess. Like it's not an established women's football culture here over a long period of time. So they naturally they've looked outside to bring in Colin Bell first and now Vera Pau and they come in as well, this is the person they've appointed from outside. These are the gurus, they have strong ideas. I was reading John Fallon's report, um, who's over there and, and spoke about how Vera Pau um had made some selection decisions related to her views about injuries in November and this time of the year and how uh, in the women's game it can be a problem and left out a couple of players on this basis. I think Rihanna Jarrett, who's been excellent for Wexford recently, and very much, you know, she's talking about how you learn how to manage the game. But this is like, this is also something that the FBI have taken put a lot of faith in. And they have to sort of deliver as well, mm. you know, and the their, their, their first game last month was against very weak opposition. Mm. And uh, this game here, they've they've sort of thrown away a promising position. So from the promise of the last campaign, I mean, just to talk about them being unbeaten, I mean, it's not really <coughs> point. Not, not really with Germany points. twice to come and Ukraine away. So we'll talk to Lisa Fallon about that in the next era. Lisa's obviously coaching over at Chelsea at the moment. Uh, meanwhile, off the ball, have got their mitts on some juicy mayo in camera minutes. Yeah, we've gotten the details of what went down last week. Mayo GEA's treasurer Kevin O'Toole admits he would give the money back to Tim O'Leary and the Mayo GEA International Supporters Federation Foundation. Pardon me. Mr O'Neill made the comments at last week's in camera meeting and off the ball as he mentioned has learned that when asked where do we now stand he responded that if it were up to him he would return the funding they'd received from the supporters group.
the International Supporters Foundation had been withholding a quarter of a million euro which was raised at a gala function in New York last year due to concerns over governance issues. Last weekend, the GA's Art Stuart Hart, Tom Ryan, intervened in a bid to end the impasse and Mayo's County Board Executive were summoned to a meeting with Connacht Council and Central Council officials to scope the extent of the problem. Balhadreen, they found the omission of media from meetings unacceptable and said the media can't be blamed for highlighting issues of governance. Governance even, the decision to play the donkey song at the recent game between Mayo and the underdogs in Castle Bar was labelled irresponsible and the club has also suggested that the County Board should seek help from full-time GEA administrators in a bid to solve their current issues. You can find more details on that story on offtheball.com tonight. Neve McCarthy has won bronze for Ireland at the World Para Athletics Championships in Dubai today. The Cork athlete threw a distance of 29.7 metres in the final of the F41 discus. It's Ireland's first medal of the Games, but unlikely to be the last of Jason Smith beginning his 100 metre salvo tomorrow. Now, uh, last night in the show, we had Sean Ingle with us, Chief Sports Writer with The Guardian. We were very much looking forward to hearing what Shane Sutton would have to say at this tribunal over in Manchester, which is looking into the suitability of Dr. Richard Freeman's. Um, a bit of suitability to continue practicing medicine. So Dr. Richard Freeman's defense of ordering the testosterone to British cycling is that Shane Sutton had bullied him into doing so because Shane Sutton was suffering with erectile dysfunction and wanted the mm. testo gel to help him with his issue. We knew that Shane Sutton was going to deny this and that he even had the, uh, that he does suffer with that condition and he was meant to speak yesterday, didn't. So he rocked up today and people were expecting something good and it became something frankly spectacular. Uh, yes indeed, as you mentioned, uh, former cycling director and Team Sky head coach Shane Sutton stormed out of Dr Richard Freeman's medical tribunal today. Freeman's facing an allegation that he ordered 30 testogel sachets to the British National Cycling Centre in 2011 for performance enhancing purposes. Testogel is banned by WADA and Freeman claims it was ordered on Sutton's behalf. Sutton accused Defence Counsel Mary O'Rourke today of being a bully and threatened to sue her for defamation. Sutton claimed of Freeman. The head of British Cycling wanted him out. He turned up to work several times drunk. He was like a scarlet pimpernel. I had two critical cases when I couldn't get hold of him, then shouted at Freeman behind the screen, you're a spineless individual. He told O'Rourke, you're saying I can't get a hard on in the press. My wife wants to come here and testify you're a liar. It wasn't for me, I never ordered it. After he stormed out, Sutton again denied that he was lying at any stage. As I said in the, you know, where's the evidence? You know, uh, one or two people might, you know, give statements or one or two jealous individuals on what you've achieved in your career. Um, but to bring up things like me winning medals in 1978, who, uh, seriously, who's interested in my past history? This is all about the here and now and about this particular case. It's not about me as, a, as an athlete. It's about me here. Uh, being head coach of British Cycling and Team Sky during that particular period and as I've said to you we, we've done nothing wrong uh, the cleanest program in the world and uh, under the, one of the world's greatest sporting leaders of our time and uh, well, I'll stick to that that you know this was nothing to do with me greatest leaders of our time, goodness me. Not explaining where the testosterone came from, by the way. I mean, it's just fantastic he's using the phrase hard on there. I mean, oh. I've been I mean, you've had three or four days to think about this, and you're like, people say, I can't get a hard on. I, I mean, I overheard people speaking about this in the office today, and I, I hadn't really followed the story at that point, and I was like, what? It's like they're reading, is someone reading it to Dear Deirdre column over there or something? Like, what, what is actually going on? I do this. It was a sporting context of it here. At one point, Freeman's QC turns to him and she's trying to get into what he feels is irrelevant, as in Shane Sutton's cycling past, and is mm. saying things like, but you would have raced in the 70s and 80s when there wasn't much testing, Shane. She's obviously trying to build a case here that he's um, been involved in he's this his whole life. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And um, he says, well, I've done, you know, I did 100 tests and I never tested positive. And she says, well, a hundred tests. I mean, have you read Floyd Landis's book, Lance Armstrong's book? To which he says, I've never read a book in my life. <laughs> which just isn't exactly be, getting the just last to be laugh. Clear, I've never been seen with a book of <laughs> yeah. any description. And he's just quite emotional the whole way through. So he said, I've never ordered any testo gel. I swear on my three-year-old daughter's life, he says. And then he turns to Freeman, as your piece alluded to, Richie, and he says, Richard, take the screen down, look me in the eye. There's a word spineless that comes into play. And all the way through, it's just gold. It's a performance. It's a serious performance. We tried to get Sean Ingle on again today to talk about it. He is obviously flat out trying to get all this into some kind of um, shape for the newspaper tomorrow, but we might talk to him uh, tomorrow. Sutton's been asked to go back on Thursday. He said he's going to discuss it with his family whether or not he's going to go back. And is his wife going to testify? I hope so now. <laughs> where, does, where, 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 where does that case go, you know? I don't know, and sure. still no one knows why the testosterone pitched up in Manchester 
at British Cycling. Mm. Someone's not telling the truth. Maybe it's, no one is. It just doesn't seem to be adding up, but uh, no, leave, leave the wife out of it, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> that legal advice, I wonder. You know, like, Why? I mean, his, his approach to it today, I mean, I'm sure he's taking advice on how he's going to approach today. You know, listening yeah, you, to you his, come up with a strategy yeah. of some description. So, has he just gone off script, or is is it just? I mean, you can't really speculate on these things, but <clears throat> it's more a case of there's an attack dog element to it. Mm. You know, calling out someone behind a screen is a pretty intense sort of tactic. Listening to his uh, scrum afterwards, it, even though it was fairly passionate, there's still a lot of couching of terms, mm. and he's being very careful. I know he has to be very careful in terms yeah. of what he can say, but he's still not giving straight answers, I would suggest. Yeah. Well, again, if, if you're unfamiliar, Shane Sutton was the former head coach of British Cycling and Team Sky, very involved with Bradley Wiggins' career, and then Dr Richard Freeman was one of the doctors. So they're fighting it out amongst themselves. That's going to continue over the next couple of days. Uh, meanwhile, where are we going? Pretty grim news from Tyrone. From their perspective, Captain Manny Donnelly is set to miss their entire National Football League campaign. He'll be sidelined for up to six months after having surgery on a tendon injury. Donnelly will also face a race to be fit for their Ulster Championship opener with Donegal. Robbie Brady is determined to make the most of his return to the Republic of Ireland squad. The Burnley winger hasn't featured since June's win over Gibraltar at the Aviva. Brady is likely to start Thursday's friendly with New Zealand and hopes that can force him into the reckoning for Monday's Euro qualifier with Denmark. Yeah, I would have loved him to be here through every single game. It's, it kills me when I'm not involved. So it just gives me that little bit of extra drive now this week to, to go and perform and, and hopefully get me same, get me, me name on the team sheet come, come the big game. But um, like you said, every game towards then I'll be looking to, I'll be looking to impress and, and hopefully do enough to, to be in my contention of a start. I'm sure you've watched all the games that you haven't been involved in, whether that be on TV or maybe at the stadium for some of the home games. What have you made of the performances and the campaign overall? Um, I think it's been it's been good. We obviously we started off brilliant. Um, the 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 final end, end games of the group are were always going to be difficult if we were looking at them. Um, but I thought we gave a good account of ourselves throughout the whole throughout the whole campaign. Um, maybe a couple of, a couple of games not as good as others, but um, hopefully we can we can put it all right and put it together and, and and we'll all be pushing in the right direction. Like I said, to to go and give a, a good account of ourselves now Monday. And you face Denmark as Northern player quite often in the last couple of years as well. What's your memories of, of those fixtures that we've had against them with hopefully another big one to come on Monday? Well, obviously the last one was disappointing. Um, we've had some we've had some good games and they're a big strong physical team as well, as well as uh, having some players who can who can who can really play. But like I said, we'd be focusing on ourselves now. Um well I certainly don't want to feel the, the disappointment like I did the last time. Um but no, it's just a good, it's a good opportunity and a good chance for us to, to show what we're about and, and, and hopefully we can all gel together and, and like I said, come up with a, a valuable result. So he's got a chance on Thursday to get into the team for Monday. Obviously Monday's the big game, but we are all looking forward to Ireland exerting revenge on New Zealand for the World Cup. Yeah. That's the big one. Totes. The All-Whites. Robbie Brady's played 109 minutes for Burnley this season. Kind of patchy, I think one start maybe in the midst of all that. And then minutes have added up here and there and everywhere. So I presume if he shows he's in decent nick and sharp on Thursday, he'd be in with a bit of a shout. Very few will be on Thursday, but he'd be in with a bit of a shout of nudging his way into the starting 11. Yeah, like he, he started. He, he did start one game in, the, in those 109 minutes. I think he played 70 odd minutes in one of the matches just after the last international break. Um, and I think you know, I, don't, I think he was fairly miffed about not being involved in the last international uh, window. But he, he probably hadn't, you know, he hadn't started a game, so that was the rationale for it. But he, he definitely, like, you know, a fully fit Robbie Brady could definitely add something to the Ireland squad ahead of Denmark on Monday. Mm. I think he hasn't had a great period in his in his life in terms of like his 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 Irish form, his club form. But in a sort of a one-off game situation. Someone that he can sort of retain possession. Like on his day, Robbie Brady is still very good. We maybe haven't seen enough, like of those days over the last couple of years. But he seems to feel maybe that he's 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 had he's had a few injury issues and then he's shaken them off and he might just be coming to peak at the right time. And yeah, why not next Monday? Conor Harvin stays on free kicks. I think we can all agree though. Uh, I think there's a there's a chance he would, but you you know you'd, you'd, you'd it's not even a contest there, Dan. <sighs> Harrahan versus Brady on free kicks. Some of Heron's delivery though the last couple of games wasn't brilliant. Yeah, and Heron mightn't start, you see. Uh, sorry, I missed the last two games. Yeah. It's the first time in I uh, forever I'd missed two Ireland games. Oh, in God, yeah. but you lucky I, I mean, because each time I like I'd recorded these because you know you were away and I would recommend watching the back show. Well, after reading about them, I like I was like, I actually can't bring myself to watch the Fast forward through aspects yeah. of it, but it's by no means certain that Heron didn't play a minute in Switzerland. 
So okay. um, I think he's got a fair chance now back at home, but just saying it's by no means certain. Okay. Some uh, juicy gossip out of England. Yeah, indeed. Uh, England manager Gareth Southgate insists his squad is together and communicating following a clash at their training camp between Raheem Sterling and Joe Gomez. Sterling's been dropped from Thursday's Euro 2020 qualifier with Montenegro as a result, but has remained with the squad ahead of Sunday's match in Kosovo. Southgate says the issue between the two of them has now been resolved. I think it's important to always um, be as fair as possible on any decision making that I make, whether that's a senior player or a junior player. Um, Quite a number of our senior players um, have been active in discussions over the last, well, certainly during yesterday. I think that's an important process because I, I want to get a, a feel for where the group are and how we can move forward together. But then I'm the manager and I have certain decisions that are my responsibility and that I was prepared to take. I think I've answered that, that there are several senior players who um, I think have been very mature, as the group have been very mature in dealing with a difficult situation. Mm. It's been fairly well, well leaked what happened here in glorious detail as well. Oh, yeah. They, they, as I said, I, mean, I know, you know it's sort of a football show topic to a degree, but I mean, it, it is unusual that they felt the need to get ahead of it so much mm. to, the, to the extent that maybe the, some information was getting out there, maybe they got wind that more information is going to get out there and you're trying to control it and be yeah. seen to take a stand with it to some degree um, yeah. but it's just, just unusual I mean that started off with a, an attempted handshake yeah. and it all goes wrong you know? but it's, it's, they all, they're all in the canteen one day Gomez is the first Liverpool player who's arrived Sterling's already there Gomez seems to sort of come up behind him and, and go to shake his hand or do something and I don't know there was obviously something in that maybe it was just the look on Joe Gomez's face Smirk. and Raheem Sterling who'd had his run-ins with three different Liverpool players including Gomez the day before he said so you think you're the big man now and everyone around kind of laughed. But then that seemed to irritate Sterling more and he went to grab Gomez's neck and then suddenly everyone realises, oh no, this is serious. They this all jump serious. in, pull them apart. Henderson was there. And uh, they both leave the canteen straight away. But then they apologise. Sterling, I think, more apologises to Gomez. And then Gomez goes to Southgate and says, look, there's no need to take this any further. I'm, I'm more than happy with, with this not being that big a deal. And Southgate says he's talked to senior players and decided for this crucial, although not crucial at all, game. Mm. It's their 1,000th game, Joe. It's their 1,000th international. Well, that's, that's a, bit, it's a great point, Richie. But uh, their, <laughs> their qualification hopes are probably OK. Liverpool fans be loving this, though. It's great information for the Liverpool fan. It's like, <laughs> so Sterling got booed throughout the game, even though he actually played pretty well. Yeah. And, and sort of, you know, he was, responds to the barracking by actually still playing quite well. Um, but the idea that, act that actually, when they go to camp, they, they still... They're still, they're still seeding, they're still, you know, they're still uh, rowing. Bit of fighting young Sterling, because let's be honest, Gomez would kill him. Mm. Would he? And if it was, I mean, they can't do it, the size differential. <clears throat> you don't know the strength of Raheem Sterling. Ah. You don't know how canny he'd be in a fight. He'd be canny. He's strong, I'd say. Yeah. I'm sure he's strong, but I just think Gomez would have had his number, so it was, you know, it, was a bit, it sure shows he's still peeved. Should make a regular segment on the show. Who'd, who'd win, win a fight? fight? Oh, yeah. Who do you want to give me? Give me another one. Who'd win in a fight? I'm not going to overthink the answers, I'm going to go on instinct. Okay. Robbie Keane and Mick McCarthy. Mick McCarthy. Really? Robbie. The age difference there. Yeah. I seem to be going for size I here saw Robbie. Time. I saw Robbie uh, post, go for height, posted Joe. a video recently of him doing some boxing training, actually. Okay, maybe. Give me a few more. Give me two more. Oh. Quick, go. Uh, Tony Pulis and Neil Warnock. Tony Pulis. Tony Pulis would kill anyone. Joe, Joe Malloy and Nathan Murphy. <sighs> Any awkward handshakes after an awards day or anything like that? Yeah, that kicks geez, it all off. That could get awkward. I don't know who'd win that one. Hey, pick, pick, any golfing one? You must have one. Brooks Kopka and Rory. Who'd actually win the... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> With one hand behind his back. <laughs> right, come on, let's go. Uh, golf, yeah. we, we've, hit the, we've hit the barrel if we're done with golfer fights. I don't know what would be more pathetic, golfer fights or me and Nathan Patrick Murphy? Patrick Reid and, and, and Brooks. Brooks wins the ball. We won't win the ball. Brooks wins the ball. Bubba Watson and Rory. But, oh, yeah. I don't know. But Watson's lost a lot of weight. I'd say um, Bubba. Was it Bubba the one that the pros all want? What was the thing about the car park? If, if you saw, a pro, who of all the pros that you play with, who, if you walked by them in a, getting beaten up in the car park, would you be least likely to stop and help? Right. And I think all but three of them said Bubba Watson. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> the best thing about golf, and there are some good things, is the anonymous surveys they do with the players who all just dish dirt on who they hate. So they do it once or twice every year. 
Mm. Is, is they all, but uh, it's a great question actually. It's the, like, most, getting us, <laughs> it's the yeah. most secondary school thing ever. That <laughs> getting us all to the car park. <laughs> like this is. <laughs> they could have. They could just ask me who do you like least. <laughs> yeah, like imagining a real life scenario. <laughs> Some, <laughs> Where some people have broken into the country club. It's like an episode park. of 999 with Michael Burke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we yeah, walk yeah. past the country club car park where Bubba Watson is being beaten up. Some hoodlums here to have encroached upon the club. hard sport to defend premises. so often. Yeah. So, uh, did you want to mention Mo Salah before we go? Yeah, it's concern from Liverpool fans. You mentioned they'd be jubilant after hearing that, but the news that Mo Salah has been ruled out of Egypt's Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers this week. Uh, he's left out of the games with Kenyan Comoros with an ankle injury sustained in that win over Man City. The forward was present at Egypt training today, but he was pictured wearing a protective boot on his left ankle. All right, okay. Uh, every night this week, chance to win dinner for two at the award-winning Brasserie at the luxurious five-star Marco Hotel located behind the Borgosh Energy Theatre. Uh, perfect for some pre-theatre dining or parties for the festive period. To be in with a chance of winning, tell us who scored Ireland's goal in that 5-1 demolition job by Denmark in the World Cup playoff in 2017. Who scored Ireland's goal in that 5-1 defeat? Name and answer, please. 53106 for 30 cents. We'll contact the winner later on. All with thanks to the Brasserie at the Marco Hotel where you can enjoy their menu. A unique twist on the the traditional. Get your text in 53106. If you want to put any more who'd win in a fight questions to me, oh, I'll go through free. them all. I'll go through them all with Dan McDonald just before <laughs> 8 o'clock. I'll give you quick, instinctive answers. Get them in. I want to, I'll give me hundreds. I'll give you, I'll give you honest answers all the way. Uh, up next, though, we're talking NFL.